you doing, Trench? I'm back. If you're a sincere seeker of truth, check that. This is no longer hidden news. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and, uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds It's with not an easy answer. It's not an easy yes or no. The standard narrative has holes in it. The standard narrative has holes in it. We are generally introduced uh, and told that the Quran was to transmitted in such a manner that there were thousands of memorizers of the Quran. There were heaps and uh, there, were, there were such a large number of people who had memorized the Quran partially and completely. And then it, these memorizers had transmitted this, this memorized Quran to the next generation and so on and so forth. And such was this large number of memorizers of the first generation in the time of the Prophet that any transmission in, of, of error uh, was rendered as secure. When it comes to evaluating hadith, here we have uh, usually one uh, report about something the Prophet peace be upon him said or did or happened in his uh, presence. And that is usually transmitted from one person to another to another, um, and, and, and the chains of transmission can be counted usually. In the case of the Quran, the, it was not possible to count. There were so many chains. Mm -hmm. there, 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 there were so many people who knew uh, within the community. It was, it was like common knowledge uh, that this is how the Quran is and this is how it is read. And this quote is taken from one of the classical authorities we have, al Zarqani. He stated, the Quran is the Arabic speech of Allah, which he revealed to Muhammad in wording and meaning, and which has been preserved in the Mus'hafs, and has reached us by Mutawatir transmission. The standard narrative has holes in it. But on the contrary, we find a Muslim Hadith book as highly regarded as the al Jamiu Sahih of Imam Bukhari, presenting two narratives which which say that actually there were only four memorizers of the Quran who had memorized the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. And uh, this is obviously in stark contrast with the claim that there were thousands of memorizers. In the case of the Quran, the, it was not possible to count. There were so many chains. Actually, there were only four memorizers of the Quran who had memorized the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. Uh, it is reported by Anas ibn Malik. He says, Matan Nabi. And then he names those four persons. Abu Darda, Mu'az ibn Jabal, Zayd ibn Sabat, Abu Zayd. So it says that these are the four people. Only it's, it, it, the, the, the style is very restrictive. It says, Lam yajma'il Quran ghayru arba. Only three, four people had memorized the Quran. I'm saying memorized because most of our scholars interpret this narrative, the word jam'ah, to be, to connote memorization. And has reached us by mutawatir Transmission. Actually, there were only four memorizers of the Quran who had memorized the Quran in the lifetime of the Prophet. What is all of this going on here? The way the Quran is arranged is the way that the Prophet ﷺ left it for us. Jibreel, the angel Jibreel, taught Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wasallam the order of the chapters. Yes? And Zayd ibn Thabit, he witnessed that. So he also knew the order that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam learned from Jibreel and also the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam taught it to other companions. This standardization comes from the Prophet himself. Even, even the, the, the order of the surahs and the verses. The standard narrative has holes in it. Um, when it comes to the order of chapters themselves, um, uh, some of this seems to have been based on the judgment of, uh, or the knowledge of the companions of the Prophet, peace be upon him. The way the Quran is arranged is the way that the Prophet wasallam left it for us. Some of this seems to have been based on the judgment of, uh, or the knowledge of the companions of the Prophet. This standardization comes from the Prophet himself. And they collectively, 
unanimously standardized the text of the Quran which we read today. The, the uh, order of the Quran, Quranic surahs in Abdullah ibn Masood's codex and of uh, Ubay ibn Kaab's codex is being displayed before you. And this has been brought to surface by Ibn Nadim's al-Fahrist and uh, Suyuti's al-Itqan. And they have displayed uh, this arrangement in their own books and said that this is how the Quran was arranged in the companion codices. Again, this question uh, struck me that uh, if uh, the Quran had a different arrangement in different companions and the Quran of Usman again had a different arrangement, then which is the correct arrangement? The Prophet ﷺ learned from Jibreel and also the Prophet ﷺ taught it to other companions. Uh, the, the Sahaba's uh, codices, yeah. for example, codices uh, as ascribed to uh, Abdullah ibn Ubay, Abdullah ibn Masood, Ali, Ali Ta'ala and whom, all of them differed with each other uh, yeah. as they have reported in our history books. Yeah. The Prophet ﷺ taught it to other companions. The Quran had a different arrangement in different companions and the Quran of Usman again had a different arrangement. Then which is the correct arrangement? What is all of this going on here? Allah Baridala tells you, God Almighty tells you in the Quran, it is his job to protect it from any type of interpolation, any type of addition or deletion. Whenever Prophet got a revelation, he repeated it to these scribes. The Prophet personally verified. He was an ummi. How did he verify? Okay, read it now. Ikra Ah, correct. So Prophet personally verified when he was alive, whatever was written down of the Quran, whether it was perfect or not. So all of these differences and these dialects were divinely stipulated. Contrary to what James is trying to suggest that these were scribal errors or intentional changes. Far from it. And if you check it with today's Musaf, it is exactly the same. Word to word, letter to letter. Anyone who has a doubt that any word of the Quran is not from it, or the Quran is missing any part, is a disbeliever. Because there is one thing that the Ummah has a general consensus in this regard, which is the Quran fully from cover to cover, from Alhamdulillah Rabbil Alameen to Surah An Nas, Min Al Jinnati Wa Nas, is definitely the word of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who doubts a word or even a letter is not a Muslim. The standard narrative has holes in it. We have certain scribal errors in the Quran, and this is something which every single scholar acknowledges. So Prophet personally verified when he was alive, whatever was written down of the Quran, whether it was perfect or not. Even the earliest versions of the Quran have these scribal errors. God Almighty tells you in the Quran, it is his job to protect it from any type of interpolation, any type of addition or deletion. Human scribes over time have been human beings. Uh, and as human beings, naturally they were um, prone to error and uh, they made many different kinds of errors. As, uh, these kinds of errors uh, are many. It is his job to protect it. As human beings, naturally they were um, prone to error. Uh, there are numerous examples in which we can see these scribal errors in which an extra va or extra ya or an extra alif is found in, in these uh, uh, versions of the Quran. Extra alif, can you believe that? Extra early. This is just crazy textual criticism. I'm not even going to address that. Extra early and wow and far. You know, anyone knows spelling differences, scribal styles may differ, may vary. It's about the contents. Uh, this is verse of Surah Naml has uh, extra alif contained in it. Uh, the words are la azibannahu azaban shadida aw la azbahannahu. As you can see, the underlined word, uh, the, uh, the alif which, uh, which uh, actually succeeds the other alif, is an extra alif because the word is la azbahannahu. Or uh, if we don't uh, accept this to be, a uh, to be something, a letter which is redundant, then uh, we find this anomaly that this word would disperse or this word would read in a very opposite way. Extra alif and wow and fa, it's about the content. Uh, we find this anomaly that this word would disperse or this word would read in a very opposite way. And the words would be awla azbahanna. It, it will be a negative particle instead of presenting the positive uh, picture. Extra alif and wow and fa, it's about the content. Similarly, another example is from Surah Al Imran. This is verse 158. And here again we find an extra alif 
دو ورڈ زار متم او قتل تم لہ تو شرون دا فرسٹ آف دیز الف از اور دا سیکنڈ آف دیز الف از ریڈن اینڈ اٹ ہیز ٹو اٹ ہیز ٹو بی فرام ریڈنگ اور ڈیلیٹڈ فرام ریڈنگ ادر وائز ویل ہیو این اپوزٹ میننگ ایکسٹرا الف این واؤ این فا اٹس اباؤٹ دا کانٹینٹ لہ تو شرون ووڈ مین دیٹ اٹ از اٹ از فار شیور دیٹ پیپل شیل بی گیدر بفور دی آل مائی But if we read it with the second alif as well, then the verse would become La ilallah, and we shall not, people, or you should not be gathered before the Almighty. So you can see there is an exactly opposite meaning. Uh, these kinds of errors uh, are many. Other than uh, the, uh, these examples, uh, there are numerous examples in which we can see these scribal errors in which an extra va or extra ya or an extra alif is found in, in these uh, uh, versions of the Quran. And it is not just the Quran that we have today. Even the earliest versions of the Quran have these scribal errors. Allah Baridala tells you, God Almighty tells you in the Quran, it is his job to protect it from any type of interpolation, any type of addition or deletion. Well, we know that in Hadith literature, there are uh, Hadiths which tell us that uh, the Quran that we have is incomplete. Uh, the Rajam verse is a, is a very typical example. It is called Mansukhu Tilawa Dunu Hukum, which mm. means that it is there. Yeah. Yes, the recital has been abrogated. Then we have the, 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 the suckling verse, uh, which uh, uh, the, uh, the mother of faithful Aisha said that uh, the Prophet had, di- was, had just died and they still read that verse in the Quran and we know, we know that it's no longer in the Quran. There is only one copy of the Quran and anyone who has a doubt that any word of the Quran is not from it or the Quran is missing any part is a disbeliever. <coughs> Surah Falak and Surah Nas are two, two very prominent Surah of the Quran. Almost every person whom we know, all of us, learn, they learn, we learn this, these Surahs by heart. And one of the famous companions of the Prophet Muhammad Abdullah ibn Masood, one of the earliest people to accept Islam in the Meccan period, he was the fifth or the sixth person to accept Islam. It is said that he never regarded these Surahs to be part of the Quran. He said these are just du'as, these are just prayers, like the prayer of the Nuh. As far as these prayers are concerned, they are not part of the Quran. The Quran ends at Surah Ahad, Surah Al-Khas. Surah Falak and Surah Nas have been wrongly placed as part of the Quran. They are, no, not, they are not part of the Quran. That is what he said, and these narratives are found in all our famous Sinatra books. And anyone who has a doubt that any word of the Quran is not from it, or the Quran is missing any part, is a disbeliever. This is not coming to us from today Orientalists. I mean, they're bringing some factors, but really the bulk of everything is coming from our own sources. It's coming from our books saying, by the way, you know, Hisham ibn Hakim, this is how he read, Omar disagreed, this is what Abdullah ibn Mas'ud said, this is what he said, Ubay said. Our books are saying this. What is all of this going on here? The question was, do Muslims also have different versions of the Quran? We have no different versions. So we have no different versions of the Quran. The Arabic Quran universally is the same. No difference between one part of the world and another. Quran is the only book which has only one version. If but it's the same book, absolutely. and it's not different one, versions. No different yeah. versions. Any like case, anyone comes and says there's different versions of the Quran. That's a ridiculous claim. Any Muslim has, that, has ever said that? Any scholar no, has ever said that? It, it's, uh, <laughs> it's as outlandish as it gets, to be honest with you. That, that fundamental uniformity is amazing. One Quran, there's no difference. Shia, you go from Indonesia to Morocco, or now from Indonesia to California, they read with the same Makharish al Huruf. There is only one copy of the Quran. The standard narrative has holes in it. And uh, confusion arises when we think about that because uh, uh, many Muslims just simply have this, uh, the simplistic idea uh, that there has only been one version of the Quran throughout history and, and that's the version that we're holding now. And when we read our history, we see in fact that there were variations, multiple readings. So we have no different versions of the Quran. The Arabic Quran 
universally is the same. No difference between one part of the world and another. Today, most Muslims read the Quran in a text that is referred to as the Egyptian edition of 1924. But this is not the only text of the Quran that is read throughout the world. The Arabic Quran universally is the same. No difference between one part of the world and another. This is not the only text of the Quran that is read throughout the world. That, that fundamental uniformity is amazing. One Quran, there's no difference. Shia, you go from Indonesia to Morocco, or now from Indonesia to California, they read with the same Makharish al Huruf. This is not the only text of the Quran that is read uh, throughout the world. Any, so anyone comes and says the different versions of the Quran? That's a ridiculous claim. Any Something Muslim has ever said that? Any scholar no, has ever said that? It, <laughs> It's as outlandish as it gets, to be honest with you. Currently, there are five different versions of the Qur'an found in the Muslim Ummah. The Qur'an is the only book which has only one version. Currently, there are five different versions of the Qur'an. When I say there are five versions, it means that there are five different versions, which have different words at times. There are verbs which are different. There are nouns which are different. There is a difference between a plural and singular. There are difference between declensions or the Arab. And then we have other differences as well. Anyone who doubts a word or even a letter is not a Muslim. When I say different versions, of course, I refer to the fact that the words are different. Uh, then there is this word order at times, which is different. Then we have, uh, uh, although there, these differences might not be very significant as far as their meaning is concerned, although there are some others as well, which have a significant change of meaning as well. But still, the claim that the Quran was preserved uh, word for word in one format, had uh, that, that claim uh, seemed to literally shake in its uh, foundations. When I say five versions, I am not talking about any pronunciation issue or the art issue. I am talking about versions, complete versions, complete set of the Quran, which have different words, different from the Quran that we see in front of us today in the United States and some other parts of the world. What is all of this going on here? He allowed them to recite exactly so, the same thing. So they're just like, it's kind of like accents. Absolutely. That's the it's kind of like accents. Accent to and about. Allah has allowed the book to be read in different accents. Exactly. They tried to prove these silly things. Oh, there's all these different types of Quran. They've never differed that there were differences of recitation. The Prophet ﷺ taught those differences. Omar got upset when he heard uh, a Quran reciter reciting it one way. He said, that's not the way the Prophet taught. He said, that's the way he taught me. They both went to the Prophet and the Prophet said, yes, I taught him that way, I taught you that way. So he taught in different dialects. So the Quran came down in these seven dialects and some of these dialects differed in wording. Synonyms were used by different tribes to express certain exp uh, words in different ways. And these synonyms were accommodated in the copy of Abu Bakr. The standard narrative has holes in it. The differences in, this, in these versions is not just in matters of pronunciation or dial or accent. He allowed them to recite exactly so, the same thing. So they're just like, it's kind of like accents. Absolutely. The differences in, this, in these versions is not just in matters of pronunciation or dial or accent. So he taught in different dialects. Warsh, uh, Qalun and Warsh, who, who are the recensions of Nafi'. They recite in the Hijazi dialect, so the language of the Warsh in particular is the language of the Quraysh. Like they said Mu'min, they didn't say Mu'min. They, they didn't pronounce the Hamza. Uh, Beni Tamim pronounced the Hamza. The Nejdi recitation is from Beni Tamim's language. So you have Hafs, they say Mu'min. The differences in, this, in these versions is not just in matters of pronunciation or dial or accent. Synonyms were used by different tribes to express certain exp uh, words in different ways. And these synonyms were accommodated in the copy of Abu Bakr. The differences in, this, in these versions is not just in matters of pronunciation or dial or accent, but it, it also relates to differences in word patterns, differences in nouns, different in a singular or plural uh, noun, and similarly in declensions or Arab. And then there are differences in particles also. For example, at, at uh, places we'll have wow or a, or a fa. What is all of this going on here?
What about this? He says in Surah Al, you know, if we, if we go even further, he, I mean, they go as far as to say that there's a thousand six hundred changes, all of which have a massive effect uh, on the meaning. That's How, yes, go ahead. Once again, it's, it's quite astonishing, really. The Qur'at, the science of the Qur'at, is yeah. one of the greatest evidences mm. for the preservation of the Qur'an, and yet, by some twisted and perverted methodology, this is actually being used to attack the Qur'an, I mean... Uh. The variations that we find between one recital and another uh, are not such uh, to change anything that Muslims believe, and, and they're not such to affect Muslim practice in any significant way. There are as much differences, if you consider the Qur'at one different from the other, then you have to consider you aren't and you are not as different meanings. Uh, you are not and you aren't. Mm -hmm. Would you understand me completely differently if I used either of those? It's just, same version, it's yeah. just a yeah. different way of saying exactly the same thing. So. The standard narrative has holes in it. May I show you, uh, viewers, that uh, if I uh, show you this Qur'an before me and I open up any page of the Qur'an, you'll find on, on, on its sides on the, uh, that you, the other variant readings of a particular verse which is mentioned in the main text uh, are, are mentioned uh, in the margins and you can see that there's hardly a page in this whole corpus of the Qur'an which is devoid of any variation in this reading. They go as far as to say that there's a thousand six hundred changes, all of which have a massive effect uh, on the meaning. There's hardly a page in this whole corpus of the Qur'an which is devoid of any variation in this reading. The Qur'an approximately of this size has about 700 pages and this is just, just one page and you can see that although it's very minutely written but if you can, can come closer you'll find it, that this one page has about 20 variations of reading the Qur'an, 20 variations and if you multiply it by 700 pages because you see uh, an average Qur'an has so many pages, you can just imagine the amount of variation you find almost every single verse being allowed to be read by our Mufassirun in some other way because according to them, the Sahaba or the Tabi'un read it in that way as well. It's just a different way of saying exactly the same thing. So if you ask me that uh, does this different change the meaning of the Quran as well, I will say yes, in many cases it does change the meaning and uh, although the change might be very minor and it might not be of, uh, in, uh, of much significance, but again it, it does change the meaning and in some cases there is a drastic change in meaning as well. The variations that we find between one recital and another are not such to change anything that Muslims believe and they're not such to affect Muslim practice in any significant way. In some cases there is a drastic change in meaning as well because when words change, when, the, when we find that there is a difference in declensions, in the verb patterns, in nouns, the mean, meaning obviously changes. What is all of this going on here? And the evidence for this is a hadith narrated in uh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, Muslim Imam Ahmed, in which the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, Jibreel came to me and recited the Quran in one manner. And he used the Arabic word one harf. And I recited it back to him. But I asked him to increase the number of harf until he offered me two, three, four, five, until he said the Quran had been revealed in seven ahruf, seven ways of reciting. So all of them are the same in meaning. They do not change uh, the meaning, but they change in pronunciation and in the finer details. Did the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam recite the Quran with these qiraat that we have today? That which seems apparent and clear from the Qur'an itself and from the Sunnah of the Prophet and from the statements of the Sahabas and the great Imams is that the Qur'an and the Qira'at that we have, the Prophet recited it. So these are the seven Ahruf, they're exactly seven Ahruf that Allah allowed the Qur'an to be recited in based upon the dialects, the famous seven dialects of the Arabian Peninsula. So, so it's not a matter of different versions of the Qur'an? It's, it's quite ridiculous really when you think about it, it's as if something new was discovered mm. or uh, 
I mean, the Qur'at have been a known and accepted science since the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam until modern day uh, 21st century. Yeah. The standard narrative has holes in it. And by the way, this is now a well-known open secret amongst many Muslim graduate students and, and, and academics around the world. And yeah. this is well-known. Traditional understandings of Ahruf and Qiraat cannot answer some of these pressing questions that are now being poked. Now, I don't really buy into that this was the divine way or this was the seven Ahruf which Allah revealed, you know, the hadith that Allah revealed the Quran on seven Ahruf. First of all, that hadith isn't even Sahih. And the evidence for this is a hadith narrated in uh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, Muslim Imam Ahmed. That hadith isn't even Sahih. And the evidence for this is a hadith narrated in uh, Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, uh, Muslim Imam Ahmed. And then I've also worked on the Isnad of these Ahruf uh, the narratives yes. and shown that not only the Marfu ones, but the Mawkuf ones, uh, of course the Mawkuf means, means the, the narratives which are reported by the Sahaba, they are not soundly reported. So this is the origin of the different recitations of the Qur'an. It all goes back to the Prophet ﷺ asking Jibreel allowance from Allah to recite the Qur'an in different ways. All Muslim scholars, they are not, they, are, they have different opinions regarding this, uh, this uh, narrative. When they say, when it is said that the Qur'an was revealed on seven ahruf, it is, we, are, we are not in a position to definitely say what this Ahruf means and what the, the word or the letter 7 or the number 7 refers to. So this is the origin of the different recitations of the Qur'an. It all goes back to the Prophet ﷺ asking Jibreel allowance from Allah to recite the Qur'an in different ways. And there are 15 opinions about this. None of them fully answer all of the questions that are raised. So this is the origin of the different recitations of the Qur'an. We find uh, different opinions, a plethora of opinions, people citing over 30 interpretations of this narrative. And a person of the caliber of Imam Suyuti has said that this narrative is among the Matashabihat, the meaning of which is only known to God. So. When the revelation of the Qur'an started upon the Prophet wasallam, the Prophet wasallam asked Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to make it easier for his ummah to memorize the Qur'an by allowing it to be recited in these various dialects. This is something that is coming at a later stage, okay? okay. The codification of the Qira'at is coming in the second, third century. And the Qira'at that we have, the Prophet wasallam recited it. This is something that is coming at a later stage, okay? Okay. The codification of the Qira'at is coming in the 2nd, 3rd century. The Qira'at have been a known and accepted science since the time of the Prophet wasallam until modern day uh, 21st century. Yeah. So these are the seven Ahruf. There are exactly seven Ahruf that Allah Azza wa Jal allowed the Qur'an to be recited in based upon the dialects, the famous seven dialects of the Arabian Peninsula. This is nonsense to say that because it's only with Ibn Mujahid that these seven became popular. But otherwise other people had said they were, you know, many more than seven. The Quran had been revealed in seven Ahruf. Uh, Dar Abu Ubaid, um, who, who had highlighted, I believe, about 20 different Qira'at. Abari had done a similar thing, uh, about 20 odd different Qira'at. You've got other people that have come along that have highlighted up to 50 the Qur'an had been revealed in seven Ahruf. And there are also ten Qira'at. And there are also fourteen different modes of recitation. And there are 120 different types of recitation. The Qur'an had been revealed in seven Ahruf. Abu Bakr ibn Mujahid only uh, selected seven of them. Before them we have Tabri actually selecting 30 readings. We have Abu Ubaid, Qasim ibn Sallam selecting 25. The issue of Ahruf and preservation and Qira'at and relationships between them, these are very, very difficult issues. And the most advanced of our scholars, they're not quite fully certain how to solve all of the unanswered yeah. questions in there. And it's very clear to you and to every single very advanced student and specialist that the standard narrative has holes in it. That's what I'm going to say. The standard narrative does not answer some very pressing questions.
And here in our audience, mashallah, we have many huffas, mashallah, who know the Quran by heart. Even if you burn the copy, you get all the huffas together, you get together, again the original Quran, word to word, letter can be reproduced. If I were to give you a blank mushaf, yeah, and, uh, and tell you to write what is munazzal verbatim from Allah into that mushaf with no human interference, would you write something which corresponds? It's with not an easy answer. The standard narrative has holes in it. The standard narrative has holes in it. The standard narrative has holes in it. Anyways, I'm done. I'll be back. Surprise!